Hello and thank you for joining me for another episode of the Finish More Music podcast. So I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Victoria Labalm for today's episode, who is the author of the excellent book Risk Forward, which I love, and who has married her inter- inherent creativity and experience in the arts with a deep desire to help people express their genius, get their ideas out to the world, tap into their creativity. So Victoria, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here and hello everyone listening. So I would love to really start at the top, which was this idea that I just said about you having this desire to help people. And in the book, you refer to it as like an inner line or a through line. Right. And I'd love to get to the bottom of that straight away so people understand very much where you're going with the book. What is a through line for someone? Excellent. Well, the through line is a theater term. Not many people know that. Uh, I've been talking about the through line for probably 20 years and all my keynotes, workshops, rock the room programs, risk forward, and people have heard it around the world. What they think of it as is often like a point or a theme. And really the through line comes from the theater artist Stanislavski. So everyone listening, you're now in on the origin of the word. Stanislavski, great Russian theater artist, designed the through line to mean that driving force in a character's behavior in a play. So every character is driven by something. So I like to think of us as characters, like in our lives. If like our life is a play, something's driving you. What is that? And that inner current, I call it an inner current as well, because I like it to feel for people hearing it, that it's fluid, that it's continuing. It's not a fixed point. It's not a theme. It's not a goal. It's something that's always moving like the inner current of your blood or a river current or the life force in a tree. So what is it that drives you? I love it. And that, that makes perfect sense to me because for me, it's always been music and then I've, and teaching and I've had that throughout my career. So I, I started out absolutely mad on music. It was, it was huge for me, but it was get a proper job from my parents. Yes. So then I become an accountant and then I was back to the music studying it. And then I needed a, a money. So back into the corporate work, but then back to music. It yes. was like you said, it always sort of pulling me back. Yeah. So the right. book's called risk forward. What's risking forward and yeah. how does that tie in with someone's through line? Ah, great question. So risking forward is that feeling of going forward, even if you're not sure where you're going. And so I want to be very clear. It's it's not the same as go for your goals because you know the goal. So how do we often in our lives move forward when we're not 100% sure it's the right move, where we're going? And I wanted to really put this forward because so many of us feel the pressure. As I say in the book, we live in a world that prizes decisiveness and clarity and goal setting. All of that's great and I'm for it. However, there's so many moments in life or on a creative project or when you're struggling for five minutes or, or five hours or five months of what is the right move? And risking forward is about trusting that inner current, even if you don't know where it's taking you. So that I think that brings me to another good point. And, and I almost think of this like a metal detector to try and find it. But how does someone know when they're on it and when they're off of it? Yeah. So I, I think I was I was fortunate in that from a young age, I was addicted to music and I, I kind of knew yeah. what I didn't know was that teaching and sharing the same very much the same as you. I didn't know that the service of others was the other big piece. And I kind of found that as I went through my journey. But yeah. how does someone know when yeah, this is this is my through line, whatever it might be, or actually I'm not, I, I think a good word might be integrity here. I'm not in integrity to, to this yeah. inner through line. Yeah, yeah. Well, the way I look at it, I um, mean, I talk about this in the book and I'm just gonna take this opportunity to show what the book looks like because uh, I have two columns on two different pages in the book that talk about how you know when you're on it and how you know when you're off it. And so, um, Keith knows this. So the book is highly visual. It's a full spectrum experience. It's not your typical book. It's modeled on a children's book, meaning every page is different. It's colorful, it's visual. Sometimes the words go in different directions. And so with regard to the chapter we're talking about now, it's actually called your inner current. And how you know you're on it is when you feel intrigued or engaged or excited. And so uh, there are these feelings of, 
being pulled forward, you're compelled, you're lit up. These words are indicative. These feelings are indicative that you're on the right track. And when you're off track, when you're not in integrity, to use your words, it's that feeling of being disheartened or disinterested or bored or flattened or scattered. And we've all had those. I just got off a conference call before this and I was not feeling any of that, you know, or any of the good ones. I was feeling all the ones I just listed. And I thought, this is not my tribe. This is not the work I want to be doing. Uh, it was so evident. And often in life, we kind of force ourselves. We're like, I got to get over it. Something's wrong with me. And we can spend a lot of time doing that. Like your job as an accountant, you know, like what's wrong? Like suck it up, buttercup, mm. instead of saying, well, maybe there's something better for me. And when we follow those elements that light us up, that's when we cook into our inner, inner genius and our hidden genius. Like they are the clues. Yeah, totally. And I, I think we've we've touched on a couple of things here, but I mentioned to you just before we started that one of the things in the book that stands out to me is that this message that runs through the book, I felt it on so many different levels, like almost this very holistic life through line that we're looking at, but the career. And then as we talked about going right down into individual pieces of art or music or an album or any kind of project that someone would be created, creating. Right. So I'd love to kind of go from the top down and look at yeah. career and then get down into the, the individual pieces of art. So I know you've had a big sort of journey with your career. Yeah. How has risking forward impacted and steered your career from where you were to what you do today? Yeah, well, my whole life has been risking forward, which is partly why I felt this was an important message. So often people would ask me, how'd you get to where you are? I mean, you were doing all these different types of art. I was a performer and a writer and a director and a producer and a choreographer and a comedian. And I drew people said, where are you going? But in a short nutshell here, you know, I took all that and I kept following it and often making choices that made no sense to others, including me. You know, where is this taking me? We've all been in those situations where we've made a choice and people question us. Sometimes we secretly question ourselves and we think, God, am I screwing up? But something is telling us to keep going, whether that's a move to another city or whether that's, you know, a choice to read a book instead of another book or make a certain type of choice in your business and career. And so for me, you know, I was an artist uh, that led me to do off off Broadway and comedy and I got picked up by a manager who managed Robin Williams and Billy Crystal and then I was doing sex in the city. It grew just by following one thing into the next uh, with 9 11 coming and I watched that from my bedroom window and my mother being diagnosed with cancer right after these two massive life events outside my bedroom window and inside my home life within a 48 hour period everything had changed and like all of us, I started asking, you know, how can I help? And what's next? And, you know, what am I meant to do? And how do I evaluate all these decisions and the world at this point? And we're all in that with the pandemic. This is a time of reevaluation. So uh, I got an offer to come and help at an event, speaking to speakers, telling them how to be more physical and tell better stories. And I have a whole coaching business and people expressing themselves on stage, on camera and in meetings. And so I started helping individuals and organizations and it just grew. Who would have thought that me, the actor, the artist would end up working with corporate executives, but I do. And so these risk forward choices lead us to places we couldn't imagine. And I wanna say one last thing for anyone with children. And I know we're an arts community here at FMM, but consider that for children, they often are following their own hidden genius. And if we try to manage from the outside and say, don't do that, that won't lead here. You should be an accountant. Don't follow your music. <laughs> you know, uh, who are we to take them off that path? Because if my parents had stopped me and they tried to initially to stop me from acting, like I wouldn't be making the kind of impact I am in the world using acting principles to teach sales or CEOs leadership skills. So you never know where a skill or a talent or a risk forward will ultimately be leading you, it knows more than you. Yeah, I, I love it. I, I think it's great. It's very much following your intuition as well here. Yeah. And I think this, in, in some areas, this sort of rubs up and creates some friction. And I'd love to get your advice on this because, you know, I, as I said, I've moved from accountancy to music, a corporate career that I was doing well in to music. So I have my experience of this as well. But there'll be people listening who are like, well, I'm, I'm in a career or I'm doing my job at the moment and 
I, I'm pretty damn confident that music is what it is. It's my hobby at the moment. I'd love this to become more full time. Do you have any advice on how someone can make the transition or when to make the jump? Because there's sort of there's some things to balance in here, I guess, for people as well. Yeah, totally. Well, one thing that I like to tell people in that situation, especially when it comes back to the through line, your earlier question, is that the through line shows up in everything that we do, or I should correct that and say, it has the potential to show up in everything that we do. Because oftentimes what we think is the outcome, like music is the through line. And ultimately like music is an expression of the through line. It's one branch of the tree, but the life force is in every branch of the tree. So let's say you're in a meeting and in a conference call and how can you bring who you really are into that mix? I didn't do a good job today on this previous conference call. I kind of shut down. But I could have, I could have brought a little more of myself and that sense of joy and creativity to that meeting. Um, and so how can you take what's inside of you, what lights you up and find ways to express it in unexpected places? So when you're meeting someone, we're not traveling these days because of the pandemic, but let's say, you know, I actually do travel a little bit. You're going to the hotel counter. How can you express that? It, it, how can you bring your inner current to each and every meeting? So as they say in the book, like, and I won't give away this question and I hope you won't keep either, but it's a very <laughs> profound question about life. So it's worth getting the book, which by the way, we should tell them right now, right, Keith? We have a way for you to get the first 20 pages of the book. Um, tell me, right? tell me. Yeah, if you go to riskforward.com slash FMM, finish more music. So riskforward.com slash FMM, you can download the first 20 pages of the book for free and you can see what it looks like and how creative it is. But there's a question early on uh, I don't know if it's in those 20 pages, just after, but it's about life. And ultimately, when you answer that question, you'll see that your answer applies to meetings, to a day, to an interaction, to a phone call, to talking to your kid. And so that's the first thing I would say is, can you express your through line even in your everyday interactions? Uh, it doesn't have to be like an either or. It's like I'm doing music or I'm, and I'm quitting my job or I'm stuck, right? Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think this is this sort of falls into this area where people often think when I have this thing, then I'll be happy. They, they sort of predicate their happiness and live in a life that's in integrity to themselves or to their through line on a circumstance that may or may not happen in the future. Whereas your advice, and I, and I love this, is look, you can tap into this in so many different ways in your life now to find yeah. joy, to be in the list that we talked about, to have all of these amazing feelings where you're on your through line not just necessarily when you're sitting down writing your music but what does that mean to you and what is that you know what inherently is that about and how can you show up in so many different areas of your life with it rather than it being predicated on well it's only if I could do it full time then I'll be happy yeah 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 you're spot on and I think that you're there are two really smart things you just touched on one is just that if when like if I get that then when I get that I'll be happy and that is a dangerous trap and people do it constantly. Uh, we're all guilty of that. Um, that's the first piece. But the second piece, which you hinted at, uh, is how can we bring it into our daily interactions? Can you be listening to music when you go to work? Can you put on music in your little cubicle? Can you use it? I have a whole section in the book around the prism effect where I talk about these ideas that we're all different colors, if you will. So let's say one color for you is music and another color for you is outdoor works. You love being outdoors. Another color for you is gardening. Another color for you is cooking. Those are passions of yours outside of your official business job. How can you bring those in? And so if music is one of yours that you love and you, let's say you're a lawyer, how do you bring in music to your work as an analogy or you know, as a, as a story? or even as something in your little office, maybe you have drumsticks on your desk and you're drumming between meetings just for fun. You know, I always tell people there are little ways to bring that into your daily life to make it full spectrum. I think it's great because there there will be various things that light people up and there are, I think, when you move from a place of saying, oh, it's a problem, I can't do this now to how can I do this? Totally. Immediately yes. it opens up so many options. Yep. So one of the things with people who are building careers in music and you know I think it's always been the case but it's there may be even more of an emphasis on it now is the networking side of things and so when people are able to get in rooms and, and make contacts this is one of the things that holds a lot of people back and it interests me because it it really correlates with this idea of the through line there'll be a lot of people who go to 
any kind of event it could be a club a party a networking event whatever it is and there's someone they really want to talk to and their through line is screaming go and talk to them but their inhibitions stop them from doing it and they might leave that party and think oh god i'm out of that environment and they feel comfortable and 10 minutes down the road in the car all of a sudden you're on that other list the list of i didn't follow yeah. my through line and my intuition yeah, yeah. obviously Hall of Fame speaker, you're super, super confident lady. How can people build their creative confidence in that kind of environment to, to speak to people and to network and to make the people connections that align with their, their through line? Yeah, I, it's a great question. Well, uh, a few things I teach. Um, and I, years ago, I, some of your listeners will know this. Uh, there's a guy named Mark Knopfler, who is a great musician with the Dire Straits, the lead guitarist, my favorite band, my favorite musician. And I wanted to go backstage and meet him. And I talked my way and I actually bribed the bouncer and I got there. And this is the first tip is sometimes the best path is not the direct one. And so I started talking to his bass player first because I knew he was the lead guitarist. Like everyone wants to talk to him, the bass player less so. So sometimes you think, how do I get closer and more comfortable? So that was one move. So that's the first thing is, is the direct path the right path? You know, maybe you talk to the assistant first. Uh, maybe you talk to the friend first. Um, although be careful because people who are circular around some celebrity often can pick up that kind of intent, like, oh, they're using me to get to. But, but number one, number two, make it about them. Like, how can you make it about the other person? Because everyone loves to talk about themselves. But do it in a way that's not obvious. So what I encourage, let's say that person is well known for something, rather than talk about that something that most others will address. If you've done your homework, could you come into another angle? Could you talk about something more obscure? So for example, I'm married to someone who's quite famous. I'll say it here because people end up spending their time looking it up. I'm married to a guy named Frank Oz, who's known for being Yoda, who's known for being many of the Muppets characters, who, who directed great films like Little Shop of Horrors, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. And people come up to him and they'll say, oh my God, I love Yoda. Well, that's 99.9 .9 out of 10. But every so often, someone at a party will come up to him and they'll say something very obscure about a specific scene in one of his films that he pays attention to because they've done their homework. This is a serious person, not a fan. So that's the next piece of advice. How can you make it about them, but not be a fan? How can you make it about them and pick something that's obscure and interesting and make that the point of discussion? Yeah, so that'd be like me talking to you about our favorite scotch. There you go, you've done your homework. <laughs> so what he's referring to, Keith is awesome, he's done his homework. So on my website, there's a page under the About Victoria, which is 10 Victoria's Secrets. And one of them is that my favorite adult beverage is scotch. And so, right, exactly. So let's say I was, you know, a huge celebrity or you're scared to talk to me. You said, hey, I, I, I hear you're a scotch lover. I'm gonna pay attention to that. I'm going to pay attention to that because it, it, it surprises me. It catches my interest and I can tell right away he's done his homework. And so we all love to be known. And that's a great way in. Um, you know, and the third is to really trust that you have something to contribute. There is, and this goes back to your intuition and your inner current and your through line. There is a reason you are drawn to that person. If it's, if it's a noble intent reason, if it's not like I want to be famous. Ah. If there's something pure, that is driving you, that's compelling you to connect to that individual, that's worth honoring. Like it's there for a reason. And, you yeah, know- no, I, I, think, I think it's great. I, I'm just, I'm just totally loving all of the advice and it's already yeah. firing things off in my brain. I think it's great. Sorry, I think you had a little bit yeah. more to add so, on. That. So just to review, recap, I gave three points. I could go on on this because this is a topic I get asked a lot because people see that I, they think I'm bold. It's more that I'm creative. So number one, See if there's a secondary route. Is it direct or is it to the side through? Number two, how can you make it about them and pick something that's obscure or unexpected to talk about so it gets their attention and shows that you've done your homework and your interest is pure? And third, you have to honor that feeling of that inner current pulling you forward. It's there for a reason because there's certain people that you yourself want to talk to, but not others. And why is that? Why is your radar, your divining rod, to go back to that, why is it drawn to that individual? It's there for a reason. That's your hidden genius, and you must honor it. 
Yeah, and the chances are you have similar through lines, obviously, because you're into the same things totally. as well. So, yeah, there's that, that yeah, connection that's, underneath. I hadn't thought of that, yeah. So I have a, a kind of, I guess, a similar question um, with people putting things out into the world. So one one of the, the big things that you focus on is, is A, let's get your, your creativity, your genius out, but then let's get it out into the world. And so a lot of people are very concerned about putting their art out in the world and judgment or their message and their authenticity and being seen. What would you advise people who, who get held held back? Because sometimes it even stops people from working on their art because yeah. their fear of putting it out there makes them sabotage even being in the moment for right. being creative. What would your advice be in that situation? Yeah, well, I think I call it taking a micro risk. So, you know, one of my big uh, disappointments in the new age personal development world is when people say go big or go home. Because the problem with go big or go home is people are like, well, gosh, I can't go big. I'm too scared. I just might as well go home. And so they don't do anything. And I'm all about micro risks. So for example, I'm right now working on a new performance piece of my own, uh, uh, totally transparent. And it's scary. I don't know if it's going to work. I don't know if it's stupid. And so I'm taking micro risks. So last week I had a creative retreat for artists. I got up in front of our family fireplace for three of my most safe friends with all this, okay, I don't know if it's good, it's not finished yet, I'm just gonna try to, <laughs> you know, all the apologies, you know, which, you know, you just have to kind of get through it. And I was like, all right, and they're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Just, and then I just, I just did 10 minutes, but they were safe. Like this is a trained group. And this is where you have to be very careful who you micro risk with, because if you show it to your spouse and your spouse is gonna frown, that immediately can shut you down. Your sister, your best friend, they may not be the right audience. So what you're looking for with a risk forward community where people learn to simply say, cool. When you share something new, you just say, cool. You know, you're, unless you're trained to give feedback or you know what kind of feedback is gonna help the person not shut them down, uh, all you say is cool. And so that's really the first thing is, can you take a micro risk and show it to one safe, wise person who might just need to say, cool back. And as you grow in confidence, you can expand that audience. So the first thing is to make it and just show it and then increase the scope. And that, that will get people so far. I mean, I've had people take crazy risks on stage and in their lives, but it starts with a micro risk. Yeah, that's brilliant. And it's interesting because it's exact parallels with what we do inside of the community. We have an event every single month where people can share their music and I train everybody on how to give feedback. Right, perfect. Because as you said, it, it can be somebody who might frown. It could be the doing that metaphorically over the internet, or it can be well-intentioned but badly positioned feedback, which can oh. be just as damaging. So, so oh, we yeah. actually create that environment for people to start with and we then have an environment for them to get their first releases with labels we affiliate with and it's this idea and I, I think it ties back to what you also said about being at the event and wanting to speak to someone and maybe there's a person before the person this yeah. idea of you can build your confidence step by step I think it's such a powerful message right right absolutely a step by step and confidence comes from you know that experience uh, the one thing I will add, though, that should make all of us feel better is if you think of your favorite book that you've ever read and then go on the Internet and on Amazon, I guarantee you there'll be one star reviews. And you'll be like, how could someone think this book has a right? The Bible. If you go and Google the Bible on Amazon and look, it has one star reviews because someone's complaining about the paperweight <laughs> and the print quality, you know? And so you're like, oh, my gosh, no matter what I do or what the, my favorite author has done, there's gonna be people who don't like it and that's okay. Um, I think what's hurtful is when people say it in a very mean spirited way and that is damaging and as artists, uh, we put our heart out there, we're naked in our souls at what makes us artists. You know, so to create art, you have to move forward, you have to risk forward. And so by the very nature of being an artist, we're vulnerable. And so you're gonna get hurt, you're gonna get hurt. Um, it's painful, but that's part of the deal. And I think if we just embrace that and know that, like when my book came out, my husband said, like the day it was published, he said, get ready, you're going to get some nasty reviews, you know? And I have, and it's like, by the way, all of you who are listening to this, do not click, do not click on the nasty reviews because it gives them juice, Go, but you can leave me five-star reviews. It means so much. Like, 
like, you know, people are going to, and it's always like the pissed off people who are going to be that kind of vocal. Like as someone who really cares about the artist, who really cares, will say, hey, I understand we're trying to go. Here's an idea that might help you. Like it's done with love. And anyone who's being mean, they have their own issues. So just remember that. Yeah, it says much more about the person who's being mean than the person they're being mean to every time. And they're very rarely people who are also some kind of artist yeah. because they know what it feels like and they wouldn't be on there doing that. And as I say, it might be sometimes it's well-intentioned and it goes wrong. But yeah. for, on the whole, the people who are mean-spirited, which that's very, very clear, that's typically because they're not in the trenches they're not yeah. doing the work they're not yeah. creatives they're not putting stuff yeah. out there as well right. and it's more about their own insecurities than it is about for example leaving a review on your book screams more about them than it does about you for sure right absolutely and you know think about after each of you as a musician i mean think about music that you really don't like like there are types of music that i really don't like it doesn't mean that that person is not a talented artist or that it's just not for me and so that's something else we have to remember. It's just like what we do. And it's, I know we like to think that what we do is going to be brilliant for everyone. It's not for everyone. Right. And that just knowing that like your audience is your audience and what you're doing, even if it's for three people or for 3 million, like your voice needs to be out there. Your voice musically needs to be out there uh, because who knows when we talk about this at the end of the book, which we won't give away Keith, right? Cause it's a highly visual, cool experience. The book is an experience, right? At the very end, you see how important it is for each of us to risk forward and put our peace out into the world because the influence is beyond measure. Yeah, totally. Now, what I'd love to do is to, you've mentioned, obviously, we know you've written the book, you mentioned you're working on a new performance piece, you've written shows in the past. So I mentioned about, we'd sort of look at the career piece and trickle down into the individual pieces of art. I love hearing about different people's creative processes. So for example, let's let's go with the book, I guess would be a, would be the one to go with. What was your creative process for the book from the initial conception of the idea to it actually becoming like, there it is, it's, it's yeah. done and you've, you've signed off of it, presumably with your editor and it's like, it's done, it's going out into the world. How did it start? And then what were the, the pieces? And I'd also love to hear, is it the same process that you use for the different things that you put out in the world? Because obviously there's a creative process for courses, for writing books, for writing shows. Yeah. Does it vary or do you follow the, a similar sort of process every time? Uh, that's a good question. It is similar in certain aspects and different in others. I mean, the first is really if it comes outside in or inside out, sometimes I get asked to do something and obviously a seed had already been planted within me. If I'm saying yes, like, oh, I, I could create that or I could do that. So for example, if a corporate client says, could you come and do this type of training for our 12 senior leadership staff? Or could you come and do this kind of a retreat for these artists? And it's a sort of a new format. I'm like, yeah, I could do that. So I take what they need, what I know I can do, and I, I bridge that gap. Uh, sometimes, like with this book, it was purely inside out. This was something I felt important uh, to say. I, it had been within me for a long time. So I'd been making notes on everything from index cards. And I talk about this in the book, what we call V cards, you know, these colored index cards to my iPhone notes section to, you know, documents in my computer. And like many people who are creative, you know, we've been keeping a little file uh, for a long time. And, and then it wasn't until I really had a deadline. I had a publisher, Hay House, the CEO approached me and he said, I hear you're working on your books. Who's publishing them? And I said, oh, I am, you know, because at that point I just thought I'm just going to do it myself. I had a very strong vision of what I wanted it to be, which was highly visual and colorful as, as we've discussed and, and really fun to look at and creative. Um, but I trusted him and he said, well, we'd like to talk about it and, and take a look. So he set up a meeting with his head. And once I had that deadline, then everything accelerated because I had to move forward. So it's not dissimilar. Like I have a keynote next week in Dallas. Um, same thing. They have these needs. I've been percolating on some ideas. I'm going to put my material together using my colored index cards. It's a whole strategy I teach in the book using these colored cards to find the rhythms and the themes and then, and then master it. But the creative process for me accelerates organically with a deadline. Like everything starts to fire as the fear kicks in and the deadlines are, I'm like, oh my gosh, I got to get my act together. <laughs> 
that's great so i love it the the initial thing is you you have an idea for something and then there'll be a load of sketches and notes and, and different ideas and then they start to form and then that will become a, a piece that then gets refined and refined but it's as soon as there's a right victoria now this is a, then all of a sudden the pieces all, all kind of come together that's great okay. Now, you use the word fear there, and I think this is really important because even on the, the front of the book, embrace the unknown and the act of being creative is stepping into the unknown. You are building something that has not been built before. Otherwise, it's not creativity. It's copying. It's as simple as that. Right. So it is something that brings with it a lot of fears and people experience creative blocks. You've worked with a bunch of creatives, obviously, in your own um, creative endeavors yourself. What are the some of the biggest fears and blocks that you've encountered either yourself or other people facing? And how do you overcome them or what advice do you give people to move past them? Um, I just want to make sure I understand your question. So it's when I'm working on something, what are some of my fears or what have I seen other significant artists it, it could struggle. be both yeah it could be it could be whatever you feel is perhaps some of the common uh creative fears that people face that stop them from moving forward uh, so for example perfectionism is one that a lot of people face and it, they never get things over the line and of course the deadline is beautiful there if somebody puts that in but it's yeah. just are there any any sort of fears like that that either crop up for you or other people that you've seen that you've like oh i see this or i experience this and this is how i move past it yeah, I think, I mean, I think the most common one for artists and myself included is, you know, what are people going to think? Um, you know, what are people going to think? And that could be on any level, you know, who, who am I to do this? Are they going to think, who are you to try this? Or gosh, you're untalented or gosh, that was a stupid creation or that completely bombed. I mean, why didn't you do X versus Y? I mean, I think those are mainly the, the, the thoughts that stop most artists is what are people going to think? But the great artists I know, and I'm talking about the greats, like, and I'm fortunate, very, very, very fortunate in my life to, to be friends with people that are award Academy Award winning directors that are Broadway comedians that have HBO specials that, uh, you know, really quite famous novelists. This is, I just am fortunate in my life to be around those types of people. And I can tell you, the best ones, they go towards the fear. In fact, I was just texting with a, a comedian named Mike Birbiglia, who some of you know, brilliant. And I was talking about this new piece I want to work on. And I said, but I'm terrified. And he texted back, follow the fear. And then I started crying because I was like, I'm so scared. And his wife texted me back, follow the tears. You know? <laughs> And, you know, because it's scary when we're really putting ourselves out there and, and uh, it's terrifying. But there was a beautiful Academy Award speech uh, not Academy, Emmy Award. I don't know if anyone here watched the Emmys and when this airs, it'll be much, much long after that. But in a nutshell, this beautiful writer who won an Emmy Award for her for her work basically just said, this is for all the writers. And in your case, Keith, I would say this is for all the musicians and the artists, you know, that follow the thing that you're scared to write about, or in this case, to do music about. That is that is where the gold is, you know? And uh, and so 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 using that almost as your indicator of where to go. It's why I wrote Risk Forward. It was the scariest thing I could possibly have done. Um, and it still scares me. So like when this podcast began and you're like, <laughs> you're like I love the book. I'm like, Phew. you know, it's still scary to put yourself out there. And, uh, but that's the reward because here's the other side of it. And this is not the question you asked, but it's the opposite. It's like, how are you going to feel if you don't? Yeah, that's a great question. How are you going to feel if you don't do it? So yes, you're afraid and oh, what will people think is what stops us. But like, how are you going to feel if you don't? And here's what takes it even further that will really light you up in a, in, in a motivated way. How are you going to feel some, if someone else does it? And then the jealousy, the envy is going to kick in. You're like, I had that idea. Why didn't I do that? Or you're at an event, someone else steps up to the mic to do their open mic or to perform their piece. Like even in your showcase, you know, and, and when you don't step forward, when you don't risk forward and you see someone else, there's that feeling of, I should have done it. And that is not a great feeling to live with. You know, yeah. I should have, I could have, because we'll never know, at least if we try, at least if we put it out there, we won't have that regret. You know, we, we've risked forward and that, 
that is the mark of the true artist. Like we move forward. It doesn't mean, as I said, and just I really, really want to clarify, it doesn't mean putting it out there in an irresponsible way, like protect the work. A great, great performing artist named Michael Motion, uh, who does work with juggling, but beautiful juggling, like, uh, you know, otherworldly. He, he taught me years ago, he said, protect the work at all costs, protect the work. And that's everything from go to bed if you have to go to bed early or be careful who you show it to, right? Um, or, or, or treat it with the respect it deserves. Like it is like a live being and we need to protect it and we need to honor it and, and follow it. And so if we don't do it, it's like an unborn soul. Yeah, that's a, what a lovely way to put it. Oh, that was a great way to round that out. I think talking about the the sort of following the fear as well, I, I refer to that as being like your North Star. And the way that I tend to think of it is, you know, it, whether it's fear or an anxiety that we might call it is to dance with the anxiety. Yeah. And I find that it, when you're following any sort of creative work, there are times when the anxiety swells and then it, it drops a little bit. You might acknowledge that it's there and breathe and let it go and carry on depending on what you're doing. And to me, it feels like it, it can, it's a beautiful dance. And if I focus on it like that, it yeah. then becomes my friend. It's my dance partner uh, rather than something that's pushing me course. back. So it is this yeah. idea of being, of yeah. being pulled along. And also this, the idea as well, which I love of, you know, how will you feel if you don't do it or if someone else does it, yeah. it's this idea of short-term discomfort for long-term comfort yeah. Yeah. or short-term uh, comfort for long-term discomfort. Cause if somebody else does it, or if you don't do it and you look back at the end of, you know, your life and your career, it, that's it. It's done. That's gone. The yeah. chance isn't there anymore. And you'll live the rest of your days. Ah, oh, if only I had done yeah. that thing. So yeah, yeah. I, I totally agree with you on that. So it's been absolutely amazing. I'd love to sort of ask one question and maybe we've already covered this because you've just shared so much great stuff. But if you had one piece of advice for, for creatives who are maybe just starting out, that, that would maybe be a piece of advice if you could jump back in a and time travel back to yourself and say, Victoria, just this, this one thing, just carry this with you as you go, what would it be? Surround yourself with people who make you feel good. That doesn't mean who tell you you're always brilliant, but who, who love and care for your art and support you. It's super important. And that, you know, if you don't have that in your family, uh, find it in your community or in your friends, because the culture we are embedded in will have a huge influence on us. So, you know, we've all spent time in our lives with people that make us feel less than. And if you're in that environment, do what you can to protect yourself and find, you know, even if it's a phone call to someone or a friend or a community like yours, find a place where you can flourish. Uh, you owe it to your art. Brilliant. What a beautiful way to, to end the, uh, the show. Um, so I'd said to you at the beginning as well, that I've obviously I've read the book twice. So what I like about it, and I just want to sort of shout this out to it is what I love about it is that it's a book that you can read from end to end and it's concise. So there's a ton of knowledge and value in it, but you've done it in a concise way. And as you said, like a fun way that pulls you through kind of, almost that, you know, I don't know if this was intentional, but it's like the through line that pulls you through the book. Totally. It's intentional. And but the other thing that I love about it as well is it's something that I can have on my desk because it's like a pearl of wisdom on every page. And it's the idea that I could either incorporate it in my morning routine and say, today I'm going to read another page, or perhaps if I'm struggling and feeling a bit like I need some inspiration, it's a book that you can pick up and open it up at almost any page. And you've put like a, it, it's almost like they're standalone ideas that all make the perfect sequence throughout the book. So I guess that maybe there's one question just before we sign off on this, which was, is that the product of having all of the cards and the ideas and it all pulling together in your process? Because now I'm saying that out loud, it feels like that might be the case. Well, yeah, that's very perceptive of you. Um, so before I answer that, I just want to say for anyone hearing this, the book is very short. You can read the entire book cover to cover in less than 90 minutes. Each chapter is about half a page or two pages at the most. 
So people do flip around. It's easy to digest. It's fun to move through for all those reasons. So when you say, and I just want to clarify, you can just pick it up and go through a chapter. Literally, it could be half a page and people use it almost like an Oracle deck. They kind of say, what do I need to know today? Or uh, So yes, it was created in large part through my strategy of these cards. It's honestly the way my brain thinks. I was a poet in college. I think in terms of short pieces, I don't know if I could ever write a novel. It's not the way my brain works, these long form stories. But I think in terms of moments, and it's how I teach my clients to put together anything, is oftentimes we have just these little pieces. A lot of musicians begin with just a little lick or a little tiny little rhythm, and from that they build off. A whole you know, little melody turns into an entire symphony. Uh, but in any case, yes, it was built through the cards, moving pieces around. There were actually three times as many pages as there are in the book. It used to be 450 pages. Like it was, I had so many ideas I had to cut. So now we're looking at the next book because I was painfully having to remove all those <laughs> chapters to make it slim and to make it focus and keep it on theme because we all want to shove everything in, but that's not a good book to read. So this is a good book to read because it's slim, it's focused, it's streamlined, it's light and on to the next. So yes, it's a full spectrum, multi-dimensional, brief experience that was built the way those cards helped me. Yes, yeah, so you can spend less time consuming, more time creating ultimately. Yeah, yeah, well, that's what I wanted. I didn't want to make the reader work, right? I wanted me to do the work so that you, the reader, can have fun with it and feel free. And that's what people say. When the number one comment we've gotten from people is, I feel this incredible permission. I feel the sense of freedom. I feel the straight jackets off me. I feel like excited to create again. Uh, and so that is, that is music to my ears. And uh, I'm so excited for everyone here to, to check it out. Again, I just want to say this URL. You can download the book for free, the first 20 pages at riskforward.com slash finish more music fmm just those initials yeah. fmm so yeah or you can just go ahead and buy it on amazon leave us a killer five star review yeah, <laughs> yeah get 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 rid of bury these uh the bury one star the troll people on the, it for yeah. sure <laughs> Brilliant. So like, and everybody, you know, you'd, you'd be mad not to go and grab the first 20 pages for, for sure. And as I said, I think it'd be mad not to go and pick up the books. I've gone through it twice already and I'm still dipping in. I think it's a, a wonderful spark of inspiration to, to have, you know, sitting there easy to hand. And as you said, it's a beautiful book to read as well. It's, it is creative in its design and how you put it together. So absolutely wonderful. Look, a huge thank you for me, oh, from me for jumping on the show. As I oh, said, when I read the book, um, I was like, we've got to see if we can get Victoria on the show. Aww. And then you agreed and it was like, yes, fantastic. I knew we'd have a great conversation. So yeah. I just want to extend a, a really heartfelt thank you to you. Thanks so much for joining me. It's absolutely my pleasure. And I'll just leave with these final words that inside of you each is hidden genius. Uh, and this book is, is there to help you unlock it. Brilliant stuff. Victoria, thanks so much. And listen, when the second book comes out, please do come back. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Bye-bye. Awesome okay. Bye.